blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavy host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The steadfast love of the, the Lord never, never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in Him. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I Welcome to Twiggenham. Thanks for coming out this morning. I am glad that you are here. If you are a guest, welcome. We're honored that you chose to be with us this morning. There's a card on the seat in front of you. You can uh, fill that out and place that in the collection plate when it passes in just a minute. If you have a prayer request, indicate that on the card and we will absolutely lift up whatever concern you have to the Lord. Just really glad that you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us. It, a little bit of an interesting take this morning on our song service. Uh, you'll notice this in the first two songs. Those were taken directly from Scripture. All of the songs that we'll be singing this morning are straight out of Scripture. We uh, are in an effort, we're kicking off an effort uh, here in January to, to be in the Word of God in 2018, to read through Scripture together. And we wanted to reflect that this morning as we uh, worship God, we want to just come straight out of Scripture with the songs that we're singing. So that's where we're headed today. And it reminded me of a passage that uh, uh, would be familiar to a lot of us uh, in, the, in the book of Ephesians. Why don't we go ahead and stand? Can we just go ahead and do that? Let's stand and hear the word of the Lord. And then we'll get on with the singing more of the word to ourselves. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, this is what Paul said. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing this morning. Let's continue that as we praise him through his word. O oh Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or earth below. O oh Lord God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven above. O oh Lord God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven or earth below. O oh Lord God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven. Oh, Lord, there is no God like you. 
Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and your gates, so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. Would you be seated as we take our offering? Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart.
And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy soul. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy strength. The Bible is an amazing book. About 40 different writers wrote the Bible over a course of about 1,600 years. They recorded it in 66 volumes called books, which are broken into two sections, an Old Testament containing 39 books and a New Testament of 27 books. 
The books were written by different individuals through the course of time and reflect their individual style and circumstances. Yet the words they penned accurately convey the message that God intended to communicate. And all the books and words are woven into a unified story that leads to Jesus. One of the amazing parts of the scriptures are the prophecies. A prophecy is a prediction about the future, a foretelling of events to come. No other religious or secular source contains the hundreds of predictions about the future provided within the Bible. And in no other source has prediction after prediction been exactly fulfilled, often hundreds of years after the prediction was initially made. The only way that was possible is that God revealed the future. The first prophecy is found in Genesis 3.15. As God addresses Adam and Eve and the serpent after eating from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God tells Satan that he, God, will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God begins to reveal how he is going to rectify what has happened in the garden. Jesus is the subject of this and many other prophecies throughout the Bible. In the Gospels, Jesus quoted them, knew them, and he understood where they were leading. Isaiah 53 is one of the passages that tells us about Jesus, the rejection he would encounter, the suffering he would have to endure, the intercession he provide on our behalf, and the peace and healing that he would provide to us all. As we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, I'm going to read that prophecy about Isaiah, Isaiah, from Isaiah 53 about Jesus. We know Jesus spent time in the synagogue. We know that he knew the scriptures. And I can imagine him standing to read this, fully knowing it was a prophecy about him now coming to fruition. Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet he was oppressed and afflicted. He did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor any deceit was in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Church, Jesus knew that he was the prophecy foretold in Isaiah 53. And he loved us enough to still come to earth despite that. And that's good news. That's good news. Let's pray. 
God, we um, pause this morning to take this communion. God, as we uh, read through Isaiah 53, it's just, it's incredible that Jesus knew what was going to happen and yet he came anyway and took our transgressions and nailed them to the cross and became the sacrifice once and for all that makes us righteous in your sight and able to think about a life eternal with you. God, as we take this bread, as uh, we remember the body of Christ, help us to examine ourselves and just remember what he did for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to God, as we now take the cup, we remember um, just a symbol of the blood that flowed for us, that cleanses and washes us and makes us white as snow in your sight. God, we accept the gift, and, and all we can really say is thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
would stand. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name, praise Jehovah in the highest, all his angels praise proclaim, all his hosts together praise him, sun and moon and stars on high, praise him all ye heaven of heavens, and ye floods above the sky, let them praise his gift Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his glory, his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Let them praise his give Jehovah, they were made at his command, then forever he established his decree shall ever stand. Hey, Steve, thank you for those uh, really great comments uh, for communion. Uh, the bulletin says Wes Alexander was going to do communion. He has the flu, so Steve stepped in. So, a lot of folks have the flu. I'm glad you're here. If you have the flu, why don't you go ahead and leave? <laughs> okay. On out there. Hey, there's a note in the bulletin, but I want to <laughs> sit. There's a note in the bulletin, but I want to go ahead and mention this because not everybody reads the bulletin. Hint, hint. Um, we're going to begin some renovations in the youth, uh, the youth wing, uh, I think this week, right? That starts this week. Actually, we've already started a little bit of that. Uh, and some of that's going to include uh, the flooring in the Mercy Building. So there's going to be some mess uh, kind of in both directions. That was some money that we had set aside at the end of 16, 2016, and then we wanted to wait until we had Caleb and Ashley on the ground to help give us input on how they wanted all that to go, and so we're finally beginning to, to, get, uh, to get started on that. So appreciate your generosity uh, historically and as it continues to go forward, but we did want to let you know that that was about to begin and watch your step. And if there's a sign that says, don't enter, obey. Don't enter, all right? And we should, hopefully that'll be done very, very soon. But wanted to let you know that's coming and to be aware of it. 
Uh, I just want to start with a great quote this morning from a theologian that uh, a lot of you may have read. Uh, he's got a book called Simply Christian that's uh, a really accessible book. And uh, that's what, where this quote comes from, N.T. Wright. He says, it's a big book. It's full of big stories with big characters. <clears throat> they have big ideas, not least about themselves. They make big mistakes. It's about God and greed and grace, about life, lust, laughter, and loneliness, about birth, beginnings, and betrayal, about siblings, squabbles, and sex, about power, and prayer, and prison, and passion, and that's only Genesis. <laughs> You know, if you think about it, that kind of sounds like a country song, too, just a <laughs> little bit. We're beginning a new series this morning called Text Message. It is written, but is it true? Since we're challenging everybody to read through the text of the Bible this year, I thought it would be wise to talk a little bit about why we think that's a good idea. Um, is the Bible all it's cracked up to be? Is it really from God in any significant way, or did just really imaginative, imaginative people make up some really cool stories? Is it true? Is it reliable? Can we trust it? Is the Bible authoritative? And if it is, what does that actually mean? That's what we'll be talking about for the next two or three weeks. Just to sort of catch you up, in case you missed last week or the week before, we are challenging ourselves to read through Scripture, to be in the Word in 2018. That challenge has come from our elders, and they're calling us to read through the Bible together. And there are a couple of things that, that set this effort apart from uh, any previous attempt you may have made to read through the Bible in a year. And can we just be real honest here? That's a hard thing to do. Uh, a lot of us have made that resolution in the past. And then we get to Valentine's Day, and we're already falling by the wayside. So a couple of things set this, this effort apart. First of all, we're providing you with some resources to help you keep the resolution. You can go to our website, twickenham.org, go about halfway down the page, and click on the In the Word tab. And that will open a page that explains the plan and connects you to something called The Bible Project. The Bible Project offers a reading schedule, an app for your device, and videos that explain what's going on in each section of Scripture. And additionally, I'm going to be blogging about what we've been reading about every week. Second, you're not going to be alone in this. Um, three Wednesday nights out of the month, we're going to meet at 6.30 and talk about what we read that week. The idea is to keep the challenge fresh, to do this as a community, to kind of encourage each other, spur one another on to this good work. One of the features in the Bible Project reading schedule is that every day you pray through a psalm, one of the, the prayers in the Bible. And so this plan not only helps you keep your resolution to read the Bible uh, consistently, but it helps you with your prayer life. And we, we don't want this to be a purely academic exercise. And so in order to maintain a devotional focus this year, we're, we're moving our instrumental service the spring to the first Wednesday night of each month. And on that night, we'll build a devotional service around one of the psalms that we've read. I'll do some teaching to unpack uh, what's going on in that psalm, and then we'll build our worship time around the themes that that psalm prevents. So uh, resources uh, to help you stay on track and community to help you maintain the commitment. It's a good plan, and I really commend our elders for leading us into this, into the Word in 2018. Okay, so you guys won't be in school tomorrow, and if you work uh, maybe in the arsenal or at a bank or something, you won't be in the office, because tomorrow is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, the day we remember him. His I Have a Dream speech delivered on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial ranks as one of the greatest rhetorical moments in history. I studied that speech extensively uh, for, uh, for a degree um, and we forget sometimes uh, that Dr. King's speech, indeed his philosophy of nonviolent civil protest, was informed and guided and deepened, not exclusively, but, but extensively, by the Bible. His most famous speech, the I Have a Dream speech, 
He quotes Amos chapter 5, verse 4, but let justice roll on like a river and, every, uh, and, and righteousness like a never-failing stream. And then he quotes Isaiah chapter 40, verse 4, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hills shall be made low, and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. There are other references to Scripture in that speech and in many others that Dr. King delivered. And if that were the only reminder we had, that would be enough to underscore the ultimate importance of Scripture. We believe the words of the Bible communicate a message of utmost and immediate urgency. We believe the, the message of the Bible is true and relevant and reliable, that it is God's message to us in text. That position has been a non-negotiable for Christianity from the very beginning of Christianity. In fact, this morning, I want to show you what the first Christians thought of Scripture and how they used it. Now, I'm going to tell you up front that you're going to have to work a little harder today than usual in order to listen for two reasons. Number one, my voice may go away. I have a throat lozenge in my mouth right now. If I turn blue and do this, somebody please come up front and do something. The other reason it's going to be a little more difficult this morning for you as a listener is because typically we will settle down in one passage of scripture and we'll just kind of live there and peel back the layers and go deep down into that and figure out what's going on. This morning, it's going to be kind of a survey. So it's possible this could get a little tedious, but I know there are a lot of engineers in the room and you are carriers of tedium. So the rest of you stay with me. Where do you find stories in, in, in the Bible? Where do you find the stories about the first Christians. Well, you find those in the book of Acts. That's the fifth book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. As Steve mentioned earlier, there's 66 books in the Bible, 39 in the Old, 27 in the New. Nearly every book is divided into chapters and verses. Some of them are so short that it's just one, uh, one chapter and divided into verses, but most of them chapters and verses. So this morning, we're in the fifth book in the New Testament, Acts, and we're in chapter one, verse 15. So at this point in the story, Jesus has already suffered on the cross. He's been buried in that borrowed tomb. He's been raised from the dead, and he has gone on to be with the Father. Before he leaves, he commands his disciples to return to Jerusalem and wait, because God is going to pour out very dramatically uh, this amazing power called the Holy Spirit. And so they spend their time in Jerusalem waiting in prayer. In Acts chapter 1, verse 15, Peter leads the waiting community in taking care of some unfinished business. They've got to find somebody to fill the, the leadership role abdicated by Judas, the man who betrayed Jesus. So I want you to listen to how Peter approaches this problem. There's a leadership vacuum so here's how Peter deals with it. In those days, this is Acts 1, 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who rested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. Here's verse 20. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Fascinating that Peter says the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David, and then he says it is written, and he quotes those passages from the Psalms. First thing Peter does in that leadership vacuum is appeal to Scripture, specifically Psalms 69 and 109. All right, now scroll down a little bit or turn the page to Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. By this point in the story, that power that Jesus promised has come. 
the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was so unusual that the people who witnessed it didn't have really a frame of reference. They couldn't figure out what was going on. And so they concluded, the only thing they could think of was these guys must be drunk. And so Peter confronts that credibility problem again by looking at Scripture. Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. And that sounds like a country song too. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. He, he points back to Scripture. In a leadership vacuum, they turn to Scripture. In a credibility crisis, they turn to Scripture. Acts chapter 4, verse 11. Two of the apostles have been hauled before the religious rulers and asked by whose authority they're doing all this preaching. And the first thing Peter does when challenged for an answer is to quote Psalm 118, verse 2. The stone you builders rejected has become the capstone. You skip all the way to Acts chapter 15. The apostle James settles a church dispute by quoting scripture. Acts chapter 18, Apollos is affirmed as an eloquent speaker with a thorough knowledge of scripture. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than the Jews in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness, and they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Paul was speaking. They said, hang on a second. I want to check the scriptures to see if what you're saying is accurate. Now, I want to pause here and make one clarification and one observation. First, to be clear, when the New Testament writers or characters refer to the scriptures, they are almost always, not always, but almost always talking about what we call the Old Testament, uh, Genesis through Malachi, or as my Italian friends say, Malachi. Obviously, the New Testament wasn't available to them yet, since it was actually being lived out to, to a great extent, and they're the ones that write it. And so nearly every time you read the words scripture or uh, the phrase, it is written, the speaker or the writer is referring to something in what we call the Old Testament, but not every time. Look in 2 Peter chapter 3, great passage. We're going to unpack this passage a little bit more next week when we talk about inspiration and, and what that means. Um, but uh, 2 Peter was one of the last books to be written. It's over toward the end of the Bible. Go to Revelation and back up. I want you to listen to what Peter says about Paul's letters. You're going you're gonna, to, if you've never seen this before, you'll love it. Bear in mind, he writes, that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom God gave him. Paul wrote with the wisdom God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. Thank you, Peter for saying what we already knew. It, it just makes me feel better that the Apostle Peter thought some of what Paul wrote was hard to understand because I think some of what Paul wrote is hard to understand. I tried to preach a series out of Romans once. I said, I, I said to the church, we're going to go through the book of Romans. And then about six months later, I went, we're going to get through this if it kills us. It was a really hard thing to preach because it's a hard book to get sometimes. So Peter says some of Paul's stuff is hard to understand. All right, here, but then listen to this. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant, unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures. The key thing here is Peter used the technical term scriptures to refer to Paul's letters. He puts them on a par with Genesis through Malachi. That's important. Because it shows us that even in the first century, some of Paul's writings had been collected into letters, in, into a, a, a gathering of letters, and that they were considered to be Scripture. Here's another one of those places in the New Testament where the New Testament writings are called Scriptures or considered to be prophetic. Uh, Revelation chapter 1. Revelation is the weirdest book in the Bible, right? 
John writes, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him, God gave Jesus this revelation to show his servants what must soon take, what must soon take place. Jesus made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. So this message that John's going to tell us about came from God to Jesus, to an angel, to John. And here's what it is. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John just comes right out and says, hey, look, this weird thing you're about to read, I got it from an angel who got it from Jesus, who got it from God. I wrote it down. You'll be blessed if you take it to heart. The book of Revelation is called Prophecy, which makes it as much a part of Scripture as anything in the Old Testament. Let me just show you one more. First, Peter, uh, First Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. Paul writes, For Scripture says, Do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. The first part about muzzling the ox comes from Deuteronomy 25. That's the fifth book in the, in, in the Bible, the Old Testament, what's called the law or the Pentateuch. But the second part about the, the worker being worthy of his wages, that's from Luke chapter 10. Paul calls Luke's gospel scripture. Since the terms scripture and prophecy are used to talk about New Testament books, Matthew through Revelation, then those books function for us exactly the same way Genesis through Malachi functioned for the first Christians. Genesis through Malachi was their Bible. Genesis through Revelation is ours. Now that's the clarification. Here's the observation. When the first Christians encountered a leadership vacuum, a credibility crisis, a challenge to their faith, an opportunity to share the message of Jesus, they consistently turned to the scriptures to formulate a response, to find an answer, to solve a problem, to step up to a challenge. They kept turning to scripture over and over and over because they trusted it as the written word of God. Now here's the question. Where do you suppose they learn how to do that? They learn that from Jesus. Uh, there's a book by, called Kingdom Ethics by Glenn Stason and uh, uh, David Gushy. It's a really good book. It's really thick, but it's a really good book that talks about how Jesus encountered Scripture and culture. Uh, in it, they write, it is clear that Jesus immersed himself in the scriptures, knew the scriptures, and lived out what he understood them to teach. There's an interesting story in Mark chapter 12 where a group of religious leaders called the Sadducees come to Jesus with a hypothetical question. It, it, it appears they're trying to draw Jesus into a debate and get him to say something that would damage his poll numbers. The issue's interesting, we don't have time to get into it, but, but I want to show you how Jesus responds to them. Now, this is Jesus, right? The Son of God, Jesus who walked with God, Jesus who was closer to God than anybody ever has been or ever will be. Here's how he responds to these people who bring up this hypothetical situation. He says, are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to, to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. A couple of things here. I love it that Jesus was not afraid to tell somebody they were wrong. In fact, he says it twice. Are you not in error? And then he says, you are badly mistaken. You're way wrong. Sometimes in our effort to get past our sectarian heritage, and we got one, we're tempted to be too accommodating, too agreeable, too ready to practice a kind of slip and slide approach to the teachings of Scripture. Jesus didn't think it was wrong to tell somebody they were wrong. Neither should we. Be nice, but don't be squishy. And then you got to realize, I got to realize, 
But you and I may be the ones Jesus is saying, you're wrong. Scripture will tell us that we're wrong. We've got to be ready to hear that sometimes. The other thing I hope you noticed here is that Jesus grounded his response in Scripture. You are in error because you do not know the Scriptures. And then he asks, have you not read in the book of Moses? Do you guys even read your Bibles? He's referring to the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the law. Jesus pointed back to Scripture. Luke 4, an even more intense moment. He does the same thing when he is confronted by the devil himself. Three times, Satan tries to get Jesus to take a shortcut to ministry glory. And then the first two times, Jesus responds by saying, it is written. The third time, he says, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. That's important because to Jesus, the words of Scripture were in the present tense. They were living and active. He kept pointing back to the book, and he believed the book was God's message in text. Luke chapter 4, later in that chapter, he preaches his first sermon. He's in the synagogue, and he stands up to read from the scroll of Isaiah. He enrolls it, and he finds the text he's looking for, and then he reads, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's an astounding passage. More than any other person who ever lived or who ever will live, Jesus walked with God. Jesus communicated with God on the most intimate level possible And yet when Jesus was confronted with questions, when Jesus dealt with temptation, when Jesus announced the trajectory of his mission, he kept turning back to the book, to the text of God's message. If Jesus needed to ground his theology, his religion, his ministry, his teaching, his living in Scripture. You and I need to ground ours in Scripture too. You don't have to be really up to speed on politics or culture to know that these days there are not many, maybe there are not any powerful world-changing speeches being delivered. Um, At least none like Dr. King's speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. I'm convinced that one of the reasons for the famine of meaningful and moving speech in our culture is our neglect of God's Word. By the Word of God, the world was made. It will not be remade. It will not be reformed. It will not be restored without the Word of God. I, I want to challenge you again. If you, if you haven't accepted this challenge to get into the Word this year with us, rethink it. It is not too late. Just pick up where we are and start reading with us. If we will get into the Word of God, the Word of God will get into us, and it will change us. God will be true to His covenant. We must be true to it as well. Let's have a prayer, let's stand, and then we'll we'll sing one more song. Holy Father, thank You for Your faithfulness. Thank You for Your long-suffering love to us. Thank you for the promises you have made to us in your word and your commitment to keep that covenant no matter what. Father, we pray that we would be disciplined this year in getting into your word and that you would keep your covenant that if we will get into your word, your word will get into us. Bless us as we read to hear. Bless us with humility to be changed by your word. Bless us with faith to believe what it says.
and to live it with great courage and confidence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or earth below. O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above. You keep your covenant of love. Your covenant of love. In heaven or earth below, O Lord God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven above. Let's close in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, and we're thankful for this, this new year that, that we've just begun and all of the hope and the promise that it brings, um, and pray that you give us the strength and the resolve to, to dive into your word this year and to, to stick through it and, and make it all the way through, and then be able to use that um, to spread that word and your message to those that we come into contact with each day. Thank you for our, our staff here at Twickenham and all that they do um, and all that they mean to us in our journeys and pray that you be with us as we go from here and into the world and help us to be examples and to shine your light to those out there that, that may not be aware. Please guide, guard, and direct us in everything that we do. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.